check, check. Check. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Yep, over there. <laughs> All right, people, we are ready to start. Um, the main room is just at the end of the corridor. But you can follow the presentations in anywhere where you can see a screen. I was looking for a button to yeah, open yeah. it, but it was just, uh, <laughs> you know, we are just about to start. Okay. And the main room is over here.
We are starting now. Are you ready? Cinema. No. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I think I just detached it from the clip. All right, hey, welcome everybody again to the DevOps Finland meetup. <clears throat> so it's a March and kind of a time for our monthly event. And uh, we have next ones also planned for April and, and May. Uh, and just missing one speaker for April right now. So if you know somebody who could come and fill up the agenda, just let me know. Uh, next meetup, so it will be on 16th of April, and just because there's now uh, Easter in between, so I'm a bit of a hasty to get the agenda in place. So I guess everybody in this room knows me more or less already, so I'm Timos Tula, one of the organizers in DevOps Finland meetup group. And uh, we have a pretty interesting lineup today here. So if you have been checking the agenda, we have uh, actually two CEOs and uh, one liar, uh, I, I mean lawyer, on the list. So, but let's see, let's see how it goes today. I suppose that uh, we still keep uh, hearing about a DevOps thing is here. That's everything on my behalf. Um, if you have any ideas for these uh, events, uh, come and talk to me. There's also AVM somewhere here who is also one of our group. He might kind of raise his hand right now there to show people that, that uh, who he is, but uh, he's the other guy who can you can talk to today about these events. But I'll shut up now and, and give the stage to Pasi. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. So, welcome to Mitor. Uh, I'm, I have just a few uh, like company uh, introduction slides, and then I'll go into. This echoes a bit. Can I maybe turn it down? Sorry. Can't find it. Well, I guess I'll leave with it. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, our motto is, is to make digital development uh, sustainable. We're a consult consulting company, and uh, uh, we've been doing this since 2007. Uh, I've been here since 2012. Uh, I used to do a lot of uh, consulting. I started our cloud competence development in 2014. So we've been do doing kind of cloud stuff with, with our customers for uh, 10 years now. Uh, we, we started with no, no cloud customers and, and right now we're at our, all of our top 10 customers are doing significant cloud stuff with us. Uh, we've done mostly AWS things, but uh, we're not in any way exclusive. We do significant stuff for Azure, 
and increasingly now since the data center is coming, so obviously that's a focus for us. Uh, we, we have like these uh, five main competence areas, so technology, obviously the con consulting, creating systems for our customers is our main, main focus. It's still something like 80% of our revenue. Uh, technology also includes uh, uh, our, the support services that I'm, I'm running. So I'm, I'm the CEO of Nitor Care that, that runs the continuous services for some of our, some of our customers. Uh, design is kind of somewhat separate. It's obviously integrates into the technology significantly. And uh, Agile, we do methodology training, uh, transformations. We, we help with people how to run their software business. Uh, and AI and analytics is, is somewhat a newer part of our, our business. And uh, we've done lots of, if you want to check out our website, there's stuff for Finair and, and uh, uh, Virtanen.ai can, for, for example, uh, analyze your electricity co consumption and, and see where you can save. And, and lastly, strategies is obviously trying to look at things at the higher level and longer timelines. Uh, we're last year 40 million euros net sales. We did actually fall short of that by I think 8,000 euros, but uh, 40 million is a ni nice round number. Uh, we're roughly 300 engineers uh, <clears throat> and coaches and whatnot. Uh, we have offices in, in Stockholm and Tampere in addition to here in Helsinki. Uh, Tampere just opened a brand new office space. Uh, Stockholm's new office space was opened, I think, one and a half years ago. So we, we've got like new premises in, in bo uh, both of these newer towns. We used to be kind of renting temporary office space in those locations. We've been number one in customer satisfaction since, since we started measuring it. Uh, Onway is, is the company that does it and, and in their data set we've been the top one since, since we've been measuring it. Uh, we've been selected the top three place to work in Europe. We placed number one a couple of times in Finland until we stopped doing it. And our credit is good. <clears throat> so that's the revenue and, and the customer satisfaction, I guess, uh, steadily going up. We had a one year where we had a bit of a hiccup and we only grew a little, but otherwise it's been quite quite stable. These are some of the customers that we worked, it, worked with, uh, a selected set. So basically all of the major retailers, all of the major banks, uh, some significant uh, media uh, outlets, uh, Bonnier, MTV, Sanoma, and also public sector customers. But I think that's enough for the company presentation, and I'll, I'll go to go to the subject. Uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce our how we built our internal infrastructure. So this isn't anything customer facing; it's, it's stuff that we use. Uh, some of the uses is just to try out new technology. Uh, see how it is is to to interact with it in in a very practical way. Some of it is something that we use daily that that runs our kind of core processes. I can show you at the end. I'll show you some of, some of those tools that that we actually do use. Uh, there's kind of two bigger uh, Nitor technologies. They're both open source and uh, Apache uh, licensed. So I think the Nitor backend which is a kind of an authenticating, authenticating reverse proxy. Uh, I think that the repo is not public, but uh, we promised several of customers that run it in, in production that it is open source and all of the license 
kind of uh, comments and whatnot are in there. It, we haven't just gotten around to publishing the repo. If there's interest in it, you can certainly have the code and, and we'll try and kind of hurry up with the, with the publication of the, of the repository. It's, it's in GitHub, we just need to switch it to public. Uh, and then uh, nameless deploy tools is, is kind of a uh, tool that uh, we created, we started it, uh, it was, I think it was 2012 or anyway, very early. Back in the day, there were uh, very little good infrastructure code tools. We had to rely on cloud formation mainly. We had a customer need for it. We had to kind of deploy a large-ish uh, infrastructure and we, we had no good tools so we started creating this and it was basically to to make uh, use of cloud formation bearable. I think at the time they, they didn't even have YAML support so uh, and uh, we felt that the JSON stuff was really super painful so the first thing we did was was a YAML to JSON transformer so that we could write the write the uh, Cloud formations in YAML. Another thing is is that we there's obviously a lot of stuff that repeats. We wanted to have like includes and parameterization and stuff like that. So uh, that's the original reason why we started uh, creating it. And, and the first version was a couple of Python scripts and but mo mostly Bash scripts. But uh, uh, so. Uh, Nowadays, what we want to do with the, the platform that we have is, is that we want to mostly kind of rely on managed services. We don't want to kind of invent all of the services ourselves or set them up separately. So uh, what uh, this kind of uh, infrastructure allows us to do is that mostly that you can uh, offload a lot of the workloads onto, onto ready-made services and uh, only, only do the business logic that we need to do. Also, uh, nowadays, since Nameless Deploy Tools supports most of the major kind of infrastructure code tools, people can use whatever they've been used to. They can use Terraform, they can use uh, ARM, the Azure Resource Manager, or whatever bicep they want. Uh, but still, they can have kind of benefit from the common workflow that we have that is shared between everybody. Uh, this is kind of an architecture picture. I guess it's mandatory. Uh, basically, we're running e ECS, uh, which has the Nitor backend uh, on all of the hosts. Uh, right now, I think there's usually three hosts that we have. It's an auto-scaling group, so I guess it can grow out. But uh, I think three is the minimum now, and, and uh, we haven't. The, the use is, is quite low, so. We, we don't need the need to scale out ever. But we could if, if we wanted to. Uh, and then uh, on those same uh, easiest instances, then we run uh, some, some Docker services. A lot of the stuff are, the logic is in lambdas. Uh, we do kind of have integrations with the uh, Confluence APIs, for example. Uh, this doesn't show the graph API, so Microsoft Graph API is also integrated into into our uh, Nitor backend stack. Uh, I think the most kind of used way to do it is that just we we have a S3 bucket with uh, static HTML, and you can create a new site just by pushing to uh, a, a prefix that is the host name that you want to deploy to. This has a star.nitor.zone uh, DNS entry, so everything that is ends in nitor.zone comes to nitor backend, and then if it hits uh, one of these, uh, if it misses all of the virtual hosts and whatnot that are defined there, it will hit the bucket and get some static HTML from there. So uh, about the nitor backend, which is, I guess, uh, front and center in, in the in the infrastructure, it's it's a reverse proxy that we've written our, ourselves. It's based on Vertex, so it's an async uh, Vertex three actually 
right now. We've been trying to upgrade it to, to four, but it's been quite painful. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it does the authentication. I, I guess that's the kind of main reason we, we have it there. And it does it with only one uh, kind of registered uh, application in, in uh, Entra ID, so formerly known as Azure uh, AD. So what it does, it, it uh, you, you go to whatever uh, site you want to access, and if you don't have the authentication cookie or a valid authentication cookie, it will redirect you to, to id.nitor.zone and remember where you came from, and it does the, the authentication dance with that, uh, and uh, then comes back to wherever you're going. Uh, and it sounds complicated, but it, it simplifies the Azure AD uh, configuration by, by quite a bit. You don't, every time you come up with a new thing that you want to publish, you don't have to change anything on Azure AD. And uh, it, as, as a user experience, is quite seamless. You don't even notice it. Uh, the, the cookies, I think, right now, they have a, like a week's lifespan. And they're also tied to your uh, local IP address. So if you change the network, you will have to re-authenticate every time anyway. So, but it, it's so transparent that people have uh, valid sessions with Azure AD, so they don't even have to put in anything. It just uh, does, does the authentication thing and gets you the uh, valid token for, for, for your cookie. Uh, it also uh, has rights to, the application has rights to get uh, kind of user's personal information and groups and whatnot. So it does that as part of the authentication flow and puts it into, into the authentication cookie so, uh, and gives it to the backend. So backends can do their own authorization. We have things like our reporting systems back there that have to be pretty specific about who gets to see what. And we do that with uh, Azure AD groups. And uh, uh, it's quite uh, e easy to manage them because all of the groups and whatnot are in Azure AD or Entra ID nowadays. And uh, we don't have to come up with <coughs> separate places to, to handling the authorization for, for all of the things that we have. Uh, so all of those things are put into a, an encrypted cookie that the client gets. So, uh, so the backend is completely stateless. It doesn't have, there's no session to replicate anywhere. All of the session data is in the encrypted cookie. And, and every time somebody requests something, the, the cookie gets checked that uh, it matches the, I think the uh, user agent is there, it's the remote IP is there. There's uh, uh, things that kind of will invalidate it if, if it seems that somebody's going to try and reuse the cookie. Uh, <clears throat> The, like I said, the simple and powerful integration to, to S3 is kind of one of the major things. Uh, we, we do support Node.js does this weird thing where if you, if you don't hit, hit an asset, it will always provide you with the index kind of the application markup. And uh, uh, we get around that by, by having a kind of... Uh, uh, regular expression to match all of the assets that you might want, and if it doesn't hit hit that, then it will always just give you the index index.html or whatever your index document is. Uh, the reason for that is also we, we're not kind of indexing the the S3 live, we, we, uh, and we don't know what is back there, so we need to kind of when the request we have the request before we get it push it to S3, we need to know are we trying to get the index or are we trying to get an asset like a, like a video or a picture or or JavaScript uh, bundle or something like that. Uh, it supports kind of transparently pre-compressed stuff. So if if the browser says that it supports broadly, for example, as they nowadays do, and uh, the the site is uh, configured so that it's allowed to get the the broadly compressed stuff, it will just get the broadly compressed asset and give it to you. And uh, uh, it's like transparent to the client and it speeds up uh, loading the sites by quite a lot. 
and then uh, there's dynamic parameters in, in the object pass that, that it then maps to, that it actually gets from S3. So the host, as I showed you earlier, is kind of a normal thing to have there. So you can have a host as a prefix and then all of the static assets that you want for the host after that prefix. And, and you can just publish, give everybody rights to push to that S3 and, and then creating a new site is just a question of pushing to a new prefix. Uh, and it supports all of the S3 operations, so if you allow it, you, it can actually push stuff into, put stuff into S3 or update or, or delete. Uh, in addition, there's a new kind of operation that we invented, which is super select. It's, uh, you can give uh, Nitor backend a, a prefix and a sel select statement, and it will run that select on all of the assets that match that prefix. So for example, if you have a bunch of JSONs in an S3 bucket, you can, uh, and it will do those in parallel. So it will then find all of the uh, objects in S3 that it needs to do a select on and then just uh, do those in parallel and then return all of the results in one uh, response. And by the way, if anybody has any, any questions, then go ahead and just ask. I'm, I'm fine with talking about any of, any of this in, in any order. Uh, an example of super select is we have face game where you, where you can kind of get to know your uh, colleagues and uh, there's a, uh, every time you play it, it pushes your uh, a JSON of your scores into S3 and then the, the high score table is just one super select of everybody's scores and it just gets all of the scores and then sorts them and, and shows them in one table. And, and uh, the face game thingy, it, it doesn't need to have any backend besides just putting stuff to S, uh, adjacent into S3 when, when somebody finishes a game. Uh, so Lambda is, is obviously a big use. Uh, it uses the API gateway proxy protocol. So uh, it makes a JSON representation of an H, uh, HTML, HTTP request. Uh, one thing that is kind of different in the behavior that uh, API Gateway tries not to base 64 encode the body when it doesn't have to. We decided that since the code in the back has to kind of be prepared for handling base 64 encoded stuff anyway, then why wouldn't we just always base 64 encoded? Uh, but obviously, if you always expecting base 64 encoded and you switch the code to be behind the API gateway, then, then you need to be prepared for having non-base 64 encoded bodies. Uh, so the Lambda gets the uh, authentication headers so you can do authorization in your Lambda code. Uh, you can also optionally give the Lambda code an OAuth token uh, that you could do graph API queries as the user that is, is requesting the, the, the Lambda execution. And we also have support the streaming Lambda API isn't that old, this, I think came in, came out last year. We also support that. So if you have a long running, let's say database query or something like that, you can uh, start pushing kind of results to the front end and Nitor backend can start pushing them to the, the browser before the whole query has even finished. But, oops, it's not a common use case. But anyway, we can do it if you want. Uh, so in addition to those, there is a pass-through API to DynamoDB, so you can do basically the same stuff that you can do to DynamoDB natively through Nitro backend just to dust the uh, uh, entra ID authentication in between. Uh, we kind of, when we implemented it, we thought it would be quite powerful, but it ha hasn't been that, uh, that popular. I think people want to do their own lambdas in between anyway, even though it's kind of basically a, a set of CRUD lambdas, but that's what they've been doing so far. I guess they want to kind of had, uh, don't, don't want to push all of the logic into the, into the browser. Uh, then we can push stuff to SQSQs. 
So it just sends a message to uh, uh, the kind of the query parameters and, and the uh, form parameters in a, in a request into an SQS queue. And uh, it's useful when you don't want to kind of, if you have something that expects super low latency. Slack is a good example. It, it, it fails if you uh, make it wait for more than 300 milliseconds. And uh, Lambda call starts, unfortunately, go beyond that, usually. So if we want to communicate with Slack, Slack usually doesn't care about anything. You, you give it 200 OK and, and uh, it's all happy. Uh, and the request will have all of the stuff you need to be able to respond to that kind of interaction end to end. I can actually show you this in action at the end, hopefully. And then obviously you can do a simple HTTP proxy. So there can be an HTTP server at the other end and, and uh, uh, it can also get those kind of backend IPs from AWS target groups. We uh, we have a, kind of an internal ALB a load balancer behind the Nitor backend that it could talk to the kind of the easiest uh, containers with. But uh, we save kind of I guess 100 milliseconds if we kind of bypass the ALB and talk to the talk to the uh, easiest containers directly and bypass the load balancer. We use the load balancer for, for other kind of development stuff anyway, so we haven't gotten rid of it. But uh, uh, I think that we could get away with not having it at all. So we could have just target groups and, and the easiest uh, things come and register and, and then uh, Nitor backend knows where to, where to direct the requests. Yep. Seamless QS queuing. Is it a pure application, a customized very, very application like for Slack? Or is it like some a generic kind of uh, way to, to do that uh, actually? It's like kind of web hook or something, yeah? How is it? No, SQS is just, just an API. So when you get what we configure, let's say, a route to map to an SQS queue. So it's a pair up. You, you do it specifically pair Slack or pair something, right? No, it, uh, yeah. right now it's. Uh, we've been thinking about doing the kind of the same uh, API gateway API, but those uh, SQS has quite a small limitation on the message size. Mm -hmm. So right now we're putting query parameters and uh, form parameters. So if you send a form or a uh, query parameters in, in the request, we push those as a, as a JSON document. But this goes into SQS as good sort of like a HTTP like a processing that. Well, there's usually one at the other end. Ah, okay. It could be something else, but usually a lambda. Uh, so, nameless deploy tools. Uh, this is kind of the other big thing, significant thing that holds the stuff together. The idea is that uh, in the design of, of the, this tool was that uh, a Git branch will map to an environment in a, in a different stage of development. So, uh, the First thing that we started with was that we have the main branch uh, maps to the production environment, and, and then there's a dev branch that maps to a test environment. So a simple, two branches, two environments. Uh, and that works fine when, when there's not a huge amount of infra development, as there often is that the infra kind of lives in the beginning quite a lot, and then uh, after that, the kind of development moves on to the application side and the infra isn't moving that much. Uh, we've had uh, kind of the other extreme so that uh, the main branch maps to a production environment and then all of the other branches map to a feature environment so that every time you create a branch, a new full environment is created for you. And this is how actually our Iron Bank application, I can show that to you, is now developed that every time somebody comes up, takes up a kind of a, a new feature to develop, they will do a feature branch and then uh, the automation will spin up a whole new environment, DynamoDB tables, all of the couple of dozen Lambda functions uh, and, and everything to, to get you started in, in developing, even if you're doing just kind of a front-end front end change. Uh, 
it, there's a lot of kind of uh, infra creation overhead here, and, and obviously you need to track everything that it, everything gets deleted. Then uh, you know you don't get abandoned feature branches. Uh, when when there's no kind of expense, you don't if you don't have RDS or anything like that, then it's not a big deal. If you have uh, a kind of a dynamically sized DynamoDB table, it's going to cost zero anyway, if there's no traffic to it. But depending on what you have, that might be kind of a lot of overhead in, in terms of kind of cost also, but also kind of trying to manage that everything gets gets deleted on time. Uh, what we, I think, think for, m works well for most cases is that uh, uh, main branch maps to a production environment and all of the others map to the testing, uh, testing environment, uh, maybe with the exception of having a QA environment uh, for, for some extra kind of acceptance testing type thing in between and uh, maybe just fork out the bits that you need to, to kind of make the front end changes possible without interfering with others. Uh, when we started out, uh, what we needed was, was uh, cause this was ba back in the days before Lambda, for example, uh, we wanted to make kind of Im immutable AM AMI images uh, and uh, that's what we did and we still do that, for example, for we have a couple of Jenkins instances running, and and uh, I think all of our customer production stuff we've we've been able to migrate over to Docker stuff. But the Docker stuff is kind of similar in a way. Uh, you you create an image and then you run that. Uh, but once we started getting kind of serverless IAC tools. Then, then we started integrating those. I think serverless framework was the first one. Uh, and then uh, uh, we, we integrated, uh, as people been interested in, and could I do my, my thing in, in Terraform more? And obviously for Azure, we had to integrate uh, ARM and BICEP and stuff like that. Uh, so now that the branches map to environments, uh, it's important that uh, we have a mechanism of, of kind of isolating the differences between environments. And, and the way you do that is you put, put them into specific properties files. There are branch specific properties files that are included only when you run uh, deploy tools from that branch. And uh, that way your actual templates and stuff between environments, they have zero differences and you can do a simple git diff and, and verify that actually all of the differences are encapsulated in the properties files. And obviously it's, it's a lot easier to kind of uh, go through the properties files of what are the differences and maybe maybe if, if you have a problem somewhere you can, you can figure out that okay, it's because this property isn't set for this branch or something like that. So, uh, we found that we've been able to kind of get away with uh, isolating all of the differences into the properties files. Uh, one kind of exception is that if there's a specially expensive parts of infrastructure that you don't want to run in testing, for example, then you can have an include that's marked optional. So in, in testing, when that file is missing, it just kind of ignores it and, and doesn't include it into the templates. Uh, and then in, in the environments where you actually need it, and then, then it's included and, and runs with the, with the parameters that you, that you set. Uh, there is a mechanism for referring to other components uh, in the properties files, also in the templates, but I guess usually we use them in the properties files. You can reference uh, uh, anything in a CloudFormation stack it doesn't have to be an output, it can be uh, a resource ID, for example. You can directly reference a resource if, if the resource ID matches the, the kind of format you need. Obviously, if you want to be explicit about it, you create an output and, and it refers to that. But the same applies to Terraform templates, uh, BICEP stuff, and uh, server, serverless framework, okay, they, they do uh, cloud, form, cloud formation stacks and CDK also does cloud formation stacks. So uh, 
the same mechanism is used. You can encrypt stuff with, with KMS keys and, and stuff like that. So uh, also it does, for, for your templates, it can resolve ECR repositories that match your kind of, for example, if you have uh, different accounts and you have ECR report repositories on each, you can dynamically resolve your ECR repository before you start running your deploy so that you have all of your ECR URLs ready to go before you do the deployment. The same applies for the AMI image IDs uh, that are kind of baked, but uh, that's not used so much anymore. We kind of have some, like I said, Jenkins servers and there's a Nexus package management server that, that we use that works that way. So uh, these are kind of the main uh, IAC tools. So CloudFormation, first one. CDK is nowadays mo probably the most popular for new stuff. Uh, CDK with TypeScript. I like to use CDK with Python. I've done a couple of stuff I can show that to you. Uh, serverless framework, unfortunately, is kind of dying, I guess. We used to like it a lot. Doesn't seem to have much of a future. Terraform, obviously. So resource manager JSON as a YAML. So YAML support for ARM, I guess that's a nice thing if you want to do ARM stuff. And, and then we also support Bicep. If, uh, that's kind of just a translated, another translation of the, of the ARM, ARM stuff. So we do and, and can deploy to all of the major public clouds. So AWS is where we use it the most, but we, we also, an example of this, we have uh, a VPN between our Azure and uh, uh, AWS environments for, for these uh, Azure AD domain services. So that, that gives the kind of the old school LDAP interface into our Azure AD. And that uh, is, is, is a, a set of components that deploys to, to, some of it deploys to AWS and some of it deploys to Azure. Obviously both ends need to be configured. Uh, and then we can deploy also in the Google uh, serverless framework supports Google and then uh, also Terraform obviously supports Google. Uh, there's a blog post by Mika Mayakorpe. I can share this uh, slide set if, if you're interested in, in this link, but it's, uh, it's from a couple of years ago, this uh, blog post about, it's about this tool and, and, and the benefits. Uh, then there's this uh, tiny little tool called S3 Auto CP, which is kind of important when people want to start uh, publishing like static websites. Uh, it it after you've done a build step on your or on your site that's typically built with Node.js and 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 some other tools like Vue or wh whatever people are using these days. Uh, it copies the static stuff into, into a prefix. So typically we have that host prefix. Uh, and then uh, it sets cache and content type headers appropriately. So obviously the content type needs to match whatever you're pushing. Uh, it matches just the file suffix as, as web servers usually do. Uh, Index.html is always pushed with, with no cache header so that uh, if you update any of the dependencies of, of the index, then, then you'll get a new index and that will then have uh, links to the various JavaScript and whatnot files so that you always get a fresh, uh, fresh set of JavaScript when you deploy something new. Uh, fonts and, and things like that essentially get internal caching headers or long TTL times. And uh, the same applies for uh, JavaScript bundles that have hashes in the file name. So that's something that's built by the uh, built uh, tool chain. And usually it has a changing hash so to cache, cache bust. Uh, so that you always get the, the correct uh, set of JavaScript, even though there's several versions there. Uh, it also does this compression, uh, gzip and, and broadly compression uh, on the fly for you so that uh, the sites seem a lot faster or are a lot faster. They, the JavaScript especially goes, goes down 
a lot in size when, when you broadly compress it. Ah, all right, I have plenty of time. Let's hope that the, that the demo gods are with us. So uh, the first one I'm showing you is not particularly useful, but I'm gonna show it to you because it, it showcases a lot of the kind of our APIs that, that we're using. So now I need to, here's a photo. Did I get it? Hopefully. I can actually, can I? Oh, it came here. Let's do like that. And take it again. Anyway, I have, yeah, I'll show this to you. Face ID. So here, uh, it recognized me and it said somebody's one trying to authenticate as me. Do you accept or refuse? And I accept. Or maybe, maybe it was the older one that I accepted. It is trying with the newer one. I accept them both. Yeah, so it recognized me from the picture. Uh, let's, let's do this one more time so I can show you the, the APIs. Oh no, obviously now it. List index other range. Will it work the first time? Uh, I, I guess I can show this, this is a, and uh, let's look at the first. So there's Nitor APIs slash me. So it's basically who am I trying to, uh, what is my information? And uh, what's special about this request is that there's, which one are these? Request or response? Those are response, so request. There should be an API key here, somewhere. Okay. There, here. So uh, when, when this uh, API recognizes me, it gives me a temporary API key. And, and that matches to my ID in, the, in kind of the back end. So since I do this request with my API key, then it, it then tells me that I am Let's see, at the end, there's, for example, the my kind of HR data here. Yeah, so Pasi Niemi, that's my Azure AD, Managing Director, Nitor Care, is my email address and whatnot. So uh, this is a Lambda in the back end that does, uh, takes my uh, Graph API token and does the, uh, Microsoft Graph API request, and then this is also this person you know, that is our HR system, so this is what it kind of knows about me. So I used to work for Nitor Creations from 2012 to 2020, for example. Let's see what else we did we have. Uh, Workspace is not very exciting, but uh, this is this controls uh, my uh, AWS workspaces. So these are kind of virtual machines that you can spin up for yourself. But uh, also, it, it kind of since I came came here, it knows who I am. It it goes and fetches, sees that do you have a workspace? If you don't, if I don't have a workspace, I have the ability to create a workspace for myself. So so a new virtual machine. I use this tool uh, to when I when I actually use a, need to use a native Windows thing for whatever reason. I I start a, a workspace a virtual machine and it says starting and takes some time to, to start. And then there's a Windows virtual machine somewhere there running for me. Uh, this is one lambda 
uh, and this kind of page is like 50, 50 lines of code, but but supported, it has the authentication and, and whatnot to, to kind of support it out of the box. Uh, index dot this, this I wanted to show you because uh, kind of get the, an idea of how much stuff this enables. We have this thing that you can just basically push uh, a new site whenever you you have an idea and, and you have all of the all of the APIs that other people have created and, and uh, I have created and it for example lists itself the URL shortener uh, I can show you, for example, Nitor Maps. So this is kind of a live map of the office and who's where. Uh, uses exactly the same kind of infrastructure. Also, uh, apparently hasn't gotten my, yeah, I'm not registered in the, in the location app, so that's why it doesn't know where I am. Uh, obviously, one interesting thing is the sauna temperature. <laughs> and obviously it doesn't work now. It used to work. I guess we need to, we need to figure out what's wrong with that. But this is also, again, just, just one, one web page that pulls in data from, from existing API. Uh, the access points here, uh, they also have Bluetooth uh, receivers and they can, they can pull stuff from, there's a Ruby tag in the sauna that, that uh, the access points can talk to and then get the, get the temperature information. Um, Office POSI is, is before uh, we started looking into kind of indoor location stuff, this is who's at the office now. During COVID, this was kind of important that you know that how many people are there, should I go or should I not go? We had a limit of, I think, 20 people at the office. Need recognitions, we have a tradition where uh, you can propose a recognition for any of your colleagues. This is, uh, this is then used every monthly meeting to read out. There's this uh, card view to read out who, who's gotten uh, recognitions and also there's kind of statistics of who's gotten the most and how many a year and uh, you can for example see how many creations people have received recognitions and so what. Uh, we have uh, a forms where you can create questionnaires and that also integrates into our kind of HR data. So you know, for example, when somebody's responding, you know which company they belong to. If they're enrolling into, into a trip, for example, then the bill will go to the correct company, for example. Uh, the event app is, is kind of interesting. When, when it, wherever we go somewhere, uh, there's this, this app will tell you what's your recommendation, who are you staying with? It has a link to the location, the address, key code, check-in time, check-out time. Uh, schedule won't show because this trip is over. But also then uh, I wanted to show the uh, face game. So if you want to know the people who, who you're traveling with, you can play this uh, face game. So I have to know that this is air and uh, mm -hmm. Olga is there and Sami is there and uh, Satu like that but this is a great way to get to know your uh, colleagues and then I was talking about this Hall of Fame ah, come on <laughs> Hall of Fame so this is The reason why this is significant, this is one uh, S3 super select over a bunch, hundreds of JSONs. And, and you saw how fast that was, that, that's kind of, oh, Hall of Fame, let's go directly. It takes a couple of seconds, but it goes through hundreds of JSONs to get you the kind of leaderboard. 
and it's not indexed in any way. It just goes through a bunch of JSON. And in parallel, do, does an S3 select for, for a bunch of JSONs. All right. I think I'm pretty close to the end of my time. Does, do people have questions? Yeah? Well, we do use, uh, the, the question was, was, are these tools non-revenue generating? All, all of this how, stuff. How do you, yeah, how do you find the time service, all these kind of things? Are these inspiration from customer projects or is it? Uh, well, like first of all, Nitor has this policy of core time. 10% of our time we can, we can use on whatever we want. Okay. But also this, uh, like I said, the first time, the first time we started developing the kind of the first initial version, it was actually for a customer case. We needed something like that, and there was nothing out there that, that kind of, uh, we were deploying a, a system that was kind of old school. It didn't fit into any, any container stuff, and, and uh, it, needed, it needed instances, and they didn't really have, the, they had only the instructions they had was kind of on-premises installation going into machines and whatnot, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to have, like that something that we deploy to production, we know what patch level, when, when have the machines been patched and to what level and, and uh, if there's something that we need to patch, we want, we want to create a new image and then just throw the old ones away and, and push the new ones. And there was nothing like that. So it was kind of very much for a customer case. Uh, Nitor backend is also, it's been used in, uh, it's been used to stream video, it's, it's in, in kind of similar use cases that we use it here. Uh, not at such a big scale as we use it, but you know, kind of, if, if you want to have just easily publishable S3 websites or just routes, it doesn't have to be kind of a full website. It can be just a route on a, on a set of applications. Uh, then then uh, it, it's an easy way to kind of achieve that instead of having to play around with CloudFront or, or whatnot. And again, we have a policy, core policy, we can use 10% of our time on, on anything, and, and that's what I've been using my time mostly on. On the other hand, when we need to get something done, it, I guess it sometimes goes over. For example, the event app, if, if we need to have a change before a trip, then, then people obviously kind of exceed their time temporarily to kind of get stuff done for the trip. And, uh, like for example, for this trip, we went to Tahko when we do the train. Uh, we wanted to have a new feature that you can see your train seat in, in the application. And, and then people had to kind of push to get that into production before, before the train leaves. So I, I think some people have exceeded their core time. But, but anyway, it, it's not like it's viciously monitored. If you exceed it, then maybe you don't use it for a couple of months. And it's not a problem. Yep. So you mentioned about the pass through Dynamo usage stuff. Um, yep. I would be interested in what kind of authentication schemes you are using with that. So if it's a complex question, you can maybe say that. No, I use it just the same. Well, what we, we support, we, we authenticate. Uh, yeah, we authenticate Slack. That's one thing. We have basic authentication, but then what we use mostly is this. Oh, IDC, it's the really standard Azure authentication where, where there's a defined OAuth2 flow and some kind of boltons on top of that. But it's standard, there's nothing really special about it. What it does in, in addition to the OIDC stuff is then once it get, has a token from, from uh, Microsoft, it will then use that token to fetch your data and feed that into the to the cookies, but Dynamo doesn't do anything with those, on the other hand. So is the, does the Dynamo have like a space for every user or is there some shared, shared space? No, it's just a pass-through API. It's, it, it, there's a table that you've defined that this is the table that is behind this URL and you can do all of the same. You can obviously, uh, the role that the, uh, the proxy runs at, you can, you can limit what, what it can do, but everything is done with the role of that proxy towards the dynamo. 
And then obviously if you need to limit, that's basically just to, for a simple use case that you just need a place to kind of have searchable data, quickly searchable data. Because S3 is pretty good already, you can just push stuff to S3 and, and, and find it. But uh, uh, if you want to have like different kind of use cases and, and uh, indexes, then I guess Dynamo could be a good fit for, but like I said, we really haven't found a good fit for that. Uh, because there's stuff like authorization, you're gonna wanna put a lambda in between for that anyway. But, but if you have a really super simple use case, then maybe it could be a fit, good fit. We just haven't found it yet. We thought it could be a good fit for, for a lot of things, but in the end, nobody ended up using it so far. Well, there's the uh, ALB in front. No, the standard shield is there, but we don't, don't really use a lot on top of that. Uh, we tr trust the authentication, so if you don't have the cookie, then you're not gonna do much. And, and uh, kind of the encryption key for the cookie is, is secret and it's on the, it, it's a simple kind of symmetric encryption with a random key. Yep. Are, are there some users that can use your bed like this? You are not your customer, so would you have no key or something like that? Yeah, well there are some users that are no longer no longer our customers but still use it apparently. But no I don't I don't think that there's been uh, People tend to like their kind of IAC tools that they've been used to and they don't, don't you, you can kind of achieve the same things uh, with kind of any of these IAC tools, but A, you're kind of locked into one then, and, and then B, uh, they don't really prescribe anything. There's kind of, in any of these tools, there's, there's tons of ways of achieving kind of a workflow where, where you try and isolate the differences into certain sections of the code base but they don't really say that, okay, this is the right way to do that isolation in your case. And uh, uh, I think that's why it's been a good fit for us. But like I said, you can achieve the same kind of similar kind of workflows with, with other tools, but then you're gonna be locked into that one. And with this, you can, you can, you can mix. And, and you can bring in some kind of other infrastructure, if, if you created some other infrastructure with Terraform, you could just drop it in and kind of take out the parameters and without a lot of, lot of work. And you don't have to migrate it into the, your tool, tool of choice at the time. But to answer the original question, no, no, I don't think there are any, any uh, users that have never been our customers. And to be honest, it's, it's starting to show its age. It's, it's, it's a decade old. And uh, I have ideas as to what could be better, but don't really have the energy to start from scratch. But I think kind of the takeaway is, is to, to kind of think about how do you isolate your differences between environments so that you can kind of review them easily. And, and kind of make sure that there's no differences between environments that you didn't intend. All right, All right. I'm over time. Thank you. I guess it's a break. Drinks yeah. are in the, in the kitchen. Uh, I think there might be some sandwiches still left. And uh, how long is the break? Uh, let's have a 15 minute break and then continue. Okay. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Let's continue. Uh, we have lots of uh, space here in the classroom if you want to join the big audience. No, that's enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hi all. Yeah. Uh, super happy to be here talking about, about some open source compliance, which is, of course, an interesting topic to all. Um, my name is, uh, my uh, topic today will be continuous open source compliance with OSS review toolkit, uh, which I'll introduce in a while. Um, Short introduction, my name is Mikko Murto. Uh, I wear this kind of a dual hat, that I'm a lawyer by training and work as a lawyer, or liar could be said, <laughs> hopefully not too often, uh, at a law, traditional law firm, H H Partners. We do business law and IP law and a lot of tech law, actually, also. We've had a long history of doing, doing open source compliance related matters. Uh, the company started it in back in, Maybe the big, big beginning was in 2008 when my SQL was sold to Sun, and we advised him in uh, various matters there, also in open source compliance with state of the art tools back then. So, so doing some very intricate grep queries over the my SQL code base. Nowadays, things have improved a little, so so it's good. Uh, I'm also a co-founder, maybe part-time-ish at uh, this double open code company that is, it started at HH Partners as a project uh, trying to automate different different aspects of open source compliance and, and now it's it's grown to be a totally separate company with, with a few employees at this time. Um, I'm, I do a lot of legal stuff here and there but I mostly enjoy working things where law and tech meet so advising tech companies in traditional legal matters and also also maybe helping lawyers to use tech tech more there are a couple of couple of um, my contact details there if anyone wants to wants to talk talk about anything related to the topic or anything else um, before we go into the the kind of main points of the OSS review tool get a few words on why open source compliance? Maybe a question first. Has anyone in this room been been kind of involved in any open source compliance related matters at work? Or there's this couple. Did you enjoy it? Is it fun? <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, that's. It's, it's a, it's a super, uh, interesting, but it was sort of like it was not so tech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is true. It's not so tech and and. Maybe maybe many people don't like it because it's it's not fun. You don't get to develop it. It's not you can can say that it's not even productive. You need to do something totally unrelated to the product. Uh, but I think there are reasons why it should be done. Uh, maybe the kind of the traditional in traditional sense it needs to be done. It's based on copyright law and. And if you use open source libraries or anything in your products, then you need to follow those kind of obligations in those licenses. Um, but we also now nowadays believe that it contributes to other stuff as well. So open source can be seen as a strategic tool. So, so for example, companies can, can get more contributions to their tooling. And if it's not their kind of core business value, then it May, may make sense to open source something, even though some business people may be hard to convince that, hey, giving away our IP may have, may have good value for us. Uh, one thing that we also hear from some people at least, maybe it's fun to, fun to kind of get your idea as well, but um, many developers nowadays do enjoy working on open source, and if the company they're working on um, allows them to, for example, spend some time at work uh, contributing to open source or 
doing stuff like that. It's, it may be a good for, for uh, recruitment matters as well. Um, if, also, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, and if, if you really go kind of, kind of, don't do it, then, then if, if people hear that you're not really following open source licenses, that I, I do believe that can be bad for your brand and reputation, even if some of the legal implications may not, not kind of be active. What, what kind of risk is in it to be? Uh, Let's see if I had some, some, yeah, some on the next side. So basically, um, if we go, yeah, should I stay somewhere else? Uh, so basically, if you use open source li licensed software, they have these licenses which have some obligations. Most licenses or that are nowadays maybe used like MIT or Apache 2.0, they are very permissive in that they uh, may be the main obligation for the people that use them are that you need to tell that you use this software and maintain the correct copyright notices, for example. But there are, of course, some, some more kind of more obligating licenses like GPL and, and AGPL, which may, may uh, require you to, well, it's this copyleft effect isn't really a really liked, liked term, but, but that uh, in principle require you to um, Publish your code with the same license as the as the original code of Britain. So then, if you have a totally proprietary product that you include GPL or HGPL code in, then someone can can at least in theory tell that hey hey this should be licensed out in GPL. Of course, no court is gonna say that you have to have to uh, put it out in GPL, but court may say that you need to pay damages, and they can be quite big. So then, uh, if if you don't do it early enough in, in your development, then there could be you could maybe need to rewrite some of your your product because you need to take out the GPL or otherwise licensed software. And uh, on, on yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, many licenses have these this kind of patent patent clauses as well. So, so you have to have these mutually uh, kind of patent um, rights. You need to give them patents, so, and you may not be able to sue people that use use your um, open source software or or kind of lose the license if you sue for patent reasons. So there are different different kinds of patent clauses, uh, but. Uh, that's kind of, those are a few reasons why open source compliance, I believe, should be done. But uh, it's not always easy. And there's kind of, this is kind of the crux what I believe open source compliance is. So there's license compliance. Does my proprietary project fulfill all license obligations from the dependencies? Um, and it applies to open source and commercial dependencies. So of course, you can buy buy things and also follow those licenses and uh, applies to open source as well. And if you, on the other hand, decide to publish your work uh, under open source uh, licenses, then you need to make sure that it's compatible with the incoming licenses. So for example, if you, if you use some GPL software, you may not be able to um, distribute the outgoing project as an MIT uh, licensed uh, binaries, for example. There's another thing that uh, is somehow related. It's not legal stuff anymore, but uh, as the kind of open source license compliance requires you to very deeply know what, what software you are using. Another thing that goes very well in hand is security compliance. Are, are there any known security vulnerabilities in your dependencies? And or do you have outdated dependencies? And maybe a third one here is that it's, it's maybe a little bit well, up and coming still, but it's kind of this community aspect, aspect. So, okay, you know that there are no vulnerabilities and you know that you're uh, applying all the licenses, right? But what is the health of the dependencies that you are using? So, for example, does, it, does some of your core dependencies have one contributor? It's, it's, it may be a quite a big risk, so bus factor of one doesn't really do well. 
or it, well, uh, is anyone here migrating of, of Redis now? There may be this kind of, if you're using some, some VC backed, backed open source software, that may be problematic if there are some license changes. So there are, there are a lot of things that you may, may need to look out for or could look out for. Um, there may be a few common misbeliefs at least in some circles around uh, open source compliance. compliance. Well, all open source software is not license-wise compatible. So what I talked about, income GPL versus outgoing, outbound MIT, for example. And this is maybe even more common is that caring about direct dependencies is enough. So if you, uh, let's say you use some modern package managers like like NPM for, uh, NPM for example, you can add these first level dependencies and look at those licenses, but then you run NPM install, you have 10x the dependencies that you thought you added. And you really need to actually look at those as well because, because you might distribute them, you often do, and they're included in your product. There's also this uh, relying on these declared licenses. So you look at the package JSON license field, it says uh, this is MIT or Apache 2.0 and uh, no worries. But then if you look at the code, it may have some, some proprietary or otherwise licensed code as well. And then, uh, well, some, some companies do have crazy company policies that require you to go through hoops with open source licensing. But it's not only that, it's about copyright law the things that we looked at doing the right thing. And um, there's also, uh, there was the executive order in the States and now the upcoming Cyber Resilience Act in Europe that requires you to create SBOMs or software bill of materials on your software. And, and that's also handled by the same tooling. So you need to know what, what you're using. That's the main point of all of this. So why automate anything? Uh, well, there are, you know it better than me. There are tons of dependencies nowadays. Uh, I often see projects that have like a thousand dependencies. If you go through all the transitive dependencies as well, so not only the nothing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you you really can't go those uh, through those hand, um, one by one, and also. Let's say 10 years ago, you released software every six months. So then you had this big, big release prep where you looked through the licenses and checked that is everything okay. But nowadays you can release multiple times a day. There's, there's really no time for, for manual work. So that's why, why continuous deployment really makes kind of automation necessary. Um, the tool I'm about to talk about, OSS Review Toolkit, started back in 2016 at some folks at Nokia at that time. They, they didn't like the tooling they were using at that time and evaluated different tools. And there was, they didn't find a single, fit, a single good fit for all requirements. Some didn't get correct dependencies, for example, not transitive dependencies or don't support software dependency scopes. And some didn't have configurable, couldn't configure, sorry. You had one policy and that was it, but if you had different business requirements or different deployment models, for example, you couldn't support those. And of course, well, those people didn't like that. Most of the maybe better tools, they were commercial, uh, they, which of course cost money, but uh, also in your vendor lock-in and, and are kind of back black box. So if it doesn't work, no, no one may, may not care. Uh, and, and you had no data ownership and could lose if you wanted to change change providers, it wasn't easy. Uh, so then those people at Nokia decided to build their own tooling as open source software to kind of fill the gaps and try not to reinvent the wheel, but combine all of the, all of the knowledge and make, make use of the existing open source tools as, as much as possible. Um, and one of the uh, it, it was good that it was core principle at tennis that it should run equally well on CI and locally, and it, it's invaluable nowadays. Um, those people then they they or some at least some of them move move to here technologies from Nokia, and then some to Bosch, and and that's kind of where the core background of of this tool comes from. But the end result was ORC or OS Review Toolkit. 
which is a kit of tools that aims to assist with the tasks that commonly need to be performed in the context of license compliance checks. Uh, it's Apache 2.0 license project. You can find it on GitHub. Um, there are some, some of the bigger companies that are currently using it, as I said, Bosch is, they're very active in de developing it nowadays. And it's been active, inactive development since 2017. Uh, maybe a, one, one long-term long problem was that they didn't do proper releases for quite a long time, but they, they started doing uh, semantic releases a while ago, and it's, it's been good for us. Um, what is org comprised of? It's comprised of these different tools as it's a toolkit. So analyzer, advisor, scanner and downloader, evaluator and reporter. I'll go a little bit deeper to them, but so analyzer tells you what you use. Advisor tells, tells you if there are security vulnerabilities. Scanner tells you if you have, what licenses are there. And evaluator tells you what to do with those license finding. Reporters, reporter makes it beautiful. Uh, so one of the main, the ORT analyzer, so the first step, one of the main kind of um, ideas is that it should work from the outside. There, there are no build system plugins that should be used, so no changes to the project is required. And that's, that's for example, us as a law firm, it's important because uh, we may, may not have, uh, we have access to the source code, but we could not really tell the developers that, hey, you need to make this change so we can make a license check for this. So it's very important for us that it works without those. It collects as much data as it can and filters la later um, and tries to do, do the best, best work it can with the kind of uh, dependency resolution. So no static parsing of uh, the, those definition files like package stations because then, then there's the build system magic working with the version a conflict resolution, for example. And it currently su supports approximately 20 package managers, which can be found in the readme in, the, in GitHub. Uh, here's uh, this kind of dependency tree from one of our, uh, one of our clients uh, has uh, kindly let us use their data in different presentations. So Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions, uh, they have this X-Road project. And there are, how this works is that they have these different monorepo projects here, which has, have different um, scopes, and they have dependencies, and then have a kind of transitive dependencies under those. So it tries to find all of those and, and keeps track of them. Uh, Ort Advisor, it checks different sources like Google OS, Vulnerable Code, or Nexus Iger, or GitHub's advisories for vulnerabilities for those packages that we found in the analyzing phase, and then tells you whether they ha have some vulnerabilities. For example, NPM Jose here has a, has a this, this uh, vulnerability, and then you can create rules for these, so you get, get different kind of warnings out of them. Uh, scanner then, um, it's not a scanner in, in itself, it's just a tooling around different open source scanners that or can be proprietary scanners as well, that you can uh, point at the source code that you just found and let, let the scanners tell that what licenses actually are inside the source files, because now we're not using the, looking at the metadata anymore only, but we want to really go through the scanner uh, licenses themselves. Uh, maybe one, uh, another up and coming thing is they've been in existence for some while, but snippet scanners, uh, which don't look for the traditional scanners, they look for things like MIT or some GPL, look, 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 mentions of the licenses, but snippet scanners look for snippets and compare that to some database that, so they can say, hey, this code doesn't have any any mentions of any license, but uh, this database says that it is actually licensed under this, this some license. And why I think this is very up and coming is due to uh, AI assistant, for example, Copilot, because, because well, it, it's a quite, quite in the air to situation with those, but, but can you ensure that the code you're writing with Copilot is not a copy of some, some things? That's, that's what snippet scanners may, may come and help us with. Uh, and it downloads, downloads the source code from uh, VCS or, or source artifacts. Uh, here's um, 
one example, this uh, at this double open company, we've been developing this kind of curation tool, so scanners aren't perfect. We need to look look through the some of the findings, and uh, so here we we have a finding marked here that that's an MIT license header and file, very well well marked. I would like to see see this in all all. Uh, open source files, and then we have that it's MIT, and here we could conclude that, hey, this isn't actually MIT if it wasn't. Uh, the ORT evaluator, it's where we all all kind of go towards. With the previous steps, the analyzer, advisor, and scanner, we have collected a lot of information. And then what evaluator allows us to do it with this Kotlin DSL, it allows us to create different sort of rules. So. We can create policies. We we don't want any GPL licenses, and then give us give us errors for those. So then we can check if they're correct and and do do what we have to do. And not limited to open source license checks at all. So the the um, evaluator rules that serve they're freely programmable and and often can be and are used also for for example advisory or vulnerability rules as well. Um, and then uh, the ORT reporter has kind of a dual uh, dual functionality, so it creates these various assets that are required when you use open source to, uh, licenses. For example, even the very permissive MIT license, it includes this, that you need to include the uh, copyright holders' names in your, or the license text in your uh, distribution, so then it helps you create those files, and also create some reports that are then uh, easy to read. For example, this is a screenshot of the web application report create, created by ORT reporter. And here we see that there's some uh, NPM font source package. It was uh, it included some rule violations. So there was some license ref that was against the policy that we used here. And then there were a couple of couple of hits of these kind of advertising those, which are not that maybe important, but the customer wanted to know where they are. Mm, what we do at Double Open, uh, as I said, the OSS review toolkit is totally open source, and so is everything we at Double Open do, but it may be at some sometimes a little pain to configure, so we try to offer ORT as a SaaS, uh, looking to accommodate different security requirements, because uh, a lot of our customers don't really want to just put their source code in, in some SaaS, but we uh, are developing some hybrid, hybrid solutions there. Uh, we're trying to offer complete solutions, so including legal and technical support. We have lawyers and we have uh, uh, developers. Uh, we actually, one of our co-founders is the lead developer of ORT itself, and, and so that's really nice. And, we can offer very good support there. And then we're building the dedicated UI for those clearance workflows because everything, uh, some people like it a lot, and it, it's, it's of course good for developers uh, that ORT is completely configurable with YAML files and, and the, the Kotlin DSL, but then when you include lawyers in the loop, they may not like it as much. Um, okay, that was kind of the core of the presentation. There's a couple of other, there's our website, uh, you shouldn't go there. It's very, very uh, not not very good at the moment. We're in the process of updating it, and but uh, if you want to laugh, you can go. And then uh, OSS Review Toolkit.org. It's documentation site for ORT, where you can find, of course, the GitHub link as well. And then at Double Open, we have this GitHub organizers where we publish our code. Okay. Any questions or any? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of uh, ORT now. Kind of everything in the compliance checking. So, are all the kind of big, expensive uh, uh, compliance check checking companies dead? Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's maybe that, uh, or it may be hard to configure. And that it, it's also one of its, its strengths and weaknesses is that it's not very opinionated. So, you can do anything related to it, do work, but that means that. If you download the Docker image and run it against your code base, you're not going to get far. So the, uh, at least currently, the commercial of offerings like Black Duck or Mentor, White Source, they, you pay them 100,000 a year and they solve your problems. And, and it's that. But if you, uh, of course, there are still the other problems. It's a black box. So if something doesn't work, the support may help you. But, but then you may need to escalate your enterprise subscription to next level or so they they have it, but they're not dead. They're not dead, of course. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I and many other people find that open source tooling for this kind of uh, tasks is a good match, and that that's what we believe in. And, and, but yeah, not yet. Maybe we can help them to be that. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that the kind of the license or copyright kind of system causes can appear anywhere in, in the project. Does yeah. it make any difference that uh, are they more binding if they appear somewhere else and mm. less binding if they are kind of hidden? Yeah, uh, probably technically not. I wouldn't say that uh, from a pure legal standpoint there would be a difference, but of course it's, let's say, uh, for something, some legal um, outcomes to come, someone has to take you to court. And and then, then it's up to the judges and the kind of binding law, what, whatever it happens to be, that of course it may be hard to convince a judge that, hey, I have this uh, 10 million lines of code project and it has 30,000 dependencies and in like sixth level dependency there's this one file that is licensed otherwise, so now pay, pay me a million. So I, I think not many judges would, would kind of agree with that, but, but better to be safe than sorry. And, and uh, yeah, if, if you go through the automation effort, then, then it, it's basically the same. You analyze the first level the same way as the sixth level, so, so it should be. But yeah, technically no difference in practice. Probably there is a difference. Yeah, OSS Review Toolkit has a couple of uh, CI integrations, J uh, GitHub Actions, GitLab, uh, and, and Jenkins, I believe. Maybe some, they, at some point, at least, there was some Azure pipelines as well. But yeah, and it's, it's a CLI tool written in Kotlin and runs on JVM, so, so you have to jump the hoops there. But, but it's kind of very programmable if, they're, uh, if you want to run it somewhere else. Yeah, that's a good question. It has traditionally maybe been mostly, well, very lawyer-led, and I'm not sure if that's the best way because because uh, some, let's say, a, a lot of lawyers are not very technically adept, and a lot of lawyers also uh, have very strong opinions how things should be done, and then then it's very hard to convince them otherwise. So, so some of the requirements coming from lawyers, for example, related to open source compliance, are very, can be very strict, and then, then it's very hard to do that work. But, uh, of course, it's legal work, so it probably needs some lawyer um, input as well. Uh, the bigger companies have started uh, creating these OSPOs, or, or open source program offices, which are, uh, usually include some, some legal legal uh, people and some tech people and some business people as well. So, so but for startups, mm, maybe not good for our business, but for startups, yeah, open source compliance is not the most important thing you need to maybe maybe tackle. Of course, you, you should do the kind of as much as you can with some, some amount of effort. And more importantly, I think, have some kind of process for using open source and, and enabling your developers to, to maybe contribute fixes to open source. Because I've seen companies that if, if you need to fix something in your dependency, make a fork out of it and maintain it. And that's a, that's a maintenance uh, nightmare outcome. Uh, why I'm asking about this case is yeah. if there's a venture capital kind of, uh, do we, do you yeah. have any experience? Do we require some sort of this uh, clear, like, I don't know, like, like yeah. That, uh, yeah. That you don't have any no, it depends. Some some venture capitalists can be quite uh, kind of tough on those, but um, so so you should be prepared to at least an answer questions, and and then if you can show that you have some kind of process, so you're not just uh, letting every developer use whatever they want without checking anything. I I think VCs don't want to see that, but if you have decently good process and then there's some some problem in some deep dependency. I think most VCs will just say that, okay, we can fix this, but but I I think it's more of a, in at least quite early level, uh, early stage investments, it, it's more like, does this, do they work well? It, 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 are the people doing good work here in this aspect as well? 
Any other question? Have I learned as a government, what I Mm. Uh, they yeah, yeah. There have been a couple of cases in that. I, I think um, one one kind of as a lawyer, one unfortunate thing about this open source comp license compliance stuff is that uh, almost all of the cases are settled out of court. So there's really no no one goes goes the whole way. So we don't really know how how European courts or the courts in the states really, for example, read GPL. And so, so for some, some cases that have been kind of these maybe predatory cases have been, someone makes a uh, fixes read me back in, in Linux and then tells that he hasn't signed off his code in this license and then use everyone using Linux and that, well, that obviously wouldn't fly in court, but, but they can go, go pretty, <laughs> pretty far there. But yeah, yeah, it, it happens, and and yeah, maybe maybe someday some some will go uh, all the way. There's now a, uh, I have to mention about the now that we're talking about court cases is there's this Visio vs Software Freedom Conservancy in the U.S., which is really interesting. That well, Visio, the TV company, they they uh, used some or didn't really follow obligations and licenses. Now now um, SFC is is suing them based on that. They didn't contribute the code, but they are. Do they have have as a totally unrelated party? Do they have a right to access of the GPL licensed source code? So it, does it? And it, it's really interesting, and it, it's. I, I I really want to see how it how it unfolds, and and that's for sure. SF, SFC's job is to go all the way, so they won't settle out of court. Any other questions? Question yeah, that's yeah. a little off topic, but you mentioned the CRA. Yeah. I know that um, my latest news is I think at FOSDEM they actually got a bunch of people together to talk about it. Yeah. Because it's a little, uh, the open source foundations were worried yeah. that it's very onerous on open source projects. Yeah, absolutely. So do you know, like, is, is there any updates on how that? No, I haven't. The law has been changed at all. Mm -hmm. It sounded like they're maybe getting some uh, legislator buy in. Yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't followed that aspect so deeply. But yeah, the problem is, of course, is yeah, you um, you don't really want to make uh, maintaining open source software harder than it is. So so not really. And I, I hope hope they really find a way around that. Yeah. And and they have other other ex, uh, exceptions as well. For example, uh, if you're source code repository maintainer like like GitHub, then you're off the hook for the open source. Uh, matters there, but yeah, I, I do hope hope they find find a good solution there because it wasn't really, really we don't don't really want to um, make it harder in Europe to innovate in open source circles as well. Okay, thank you very much. It was nice to be here. Yeah, thank you, Mikko. Uh, just one thing that came to my mind from your presentation was that uh, remember that kind of when the uh, Wright brothers invented the airplane, they thought that their invention would make any future wars impossible. <laughs> it's just like kind of uh, when we had the old time uh, closed source software and all the Microsoft, Oracle, whatever companies there in the business that uh, then people thought that, hey, we make this open source to make all lawyers unemployed, but the kind of uh, open source and lawyers, it's a match made in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a 15 minute break and then have the last presentation today.
All right, people, let's get started with the last presentation today. And again, there is uh, lots of space in the classroom, so you are welcome here. It's the only place to ask any questions. Mä menin tätä tökkimään, tota, kun mä yritin tätä audiota lähteä katsomaan tuossa mun säätää, mutta se kuva hävisi täällä. Se hävisi tuosta se kuva. Okay, good evening. Uh, so thank you for invitation uh, to, to be here with you. This is my first meetup uh, in, in Devos, Finland, and it's been great. Thank you for in invitation, and it's a very good presentation. We will continue uh, uh, in this presentation in, in open source world, so, so basically uh, the, the same theme from a little bit uh, different uh, uh, perspective. Uh, we will uh, take a, a short look into the uh, pretty interesting technology uh, called uh, uh, Backstage, and it's, it's uh, uh, quite hot topic uh, in, in uh, certain instances at the moment, and, and uh, at least uh, when I found, it, uh, found out it, it was very interesting kind of technology, and, and we thought that uh, this might uh, be interest of yours as well. Um, about the company uh, presentation very shortly in the first round. My name was Markus Kärjänen and is Markus Kärjänen and I'm a founder of Kevo. Uh, and uh, Kevo is a pretty uh, new startup company. Uh, we just started in basically in January, uh, so a so few months back. Uh, but uh, thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, uh, but uh, we started the preparation, of course, uh, uh, last year, and, and uh, therefore, therefore, been uh, uh, there for a while. Uh, but uh, company name Kevo, Kevo is, is uh, representing quality evolution. So basically, we are focusing purely on the uh, agile software quality, and uh, uh, we we have. Uh, ma basically three perspectives to the quality so so believe of course we do testing and and quality assurance it's a self evident and it's a core one core uh, services of kevo but uh, we believe that the quality needs to be built into the product so quality needs to be stretched uh, into the process of software development and that's uh, why we are also uh, from the quality perspective interested in backstage and and developer portal type of solutions. But uh, the third part, what we believe that quality needs is also the quality culture in the, uh, in the corporations. And we try to uh, enforce and support organizations to build certain kind of culture, how people think uh, about quality. Do they believe it's important how they act in the daily uh, decisions concerning uh, software development? which uh, decisions end up in, in good quality and which decisions end up in a not that good quality. But we try to uh, support quality uh, uh, culture in the companies as well. So that's about uh, Kevo at the moment. 
uh, we will focus today in, in backstage and, and uh, uh, I must apologize. My colleague who is our technical uh, uh, person uh, couldn't make it this evening to the, uh, the family uh, and, and children care issues, but uh, I try to respond also your questions as, as much as I can. But if I can't answer some of those uh, questions, then I will come back to you later. But I try to do my best there. As a background for uh, developer portal and, and uh, backstage, I basically uh, uh, found this topic last uh, summer and, and uh, I was introduced to this backstage and I was a little bit uh, uh, concerned that, hey, what, what is this? But pretty soon, I, when I started to study it, I end up uh, into two another topics. Uh, one was uh, platform er engineering, another one was uh, developer experience. And I noticed that developer experience was, I guess, uh, uh, a topic for you in last meeting in, in the, or, or some prior meetings in, in uh, uh, DevOps Finland meetups, uh, but it might be uh, familiar for, for you as already by now. Yeah. Well, just to mention that now that you said it, that kind of I just remember that the developer experience was actually present in this very same room when we were here last time. February last year. Okay, it was February last year. <laughs> okay, Happy. so Might okay. Have been even since, but I just remember that we had the <laughs> DevEx presentation just in this room last time. That's true. That's true. But platform engineering uh, it is uh, about how do you uh, divide work and how do you build up your teams uh, in uh, software development and, and uh, they talk about the feature teams and they talk about uh, enabling teams and and. Uh, 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 that sort of things in, in platform engineering. And it seems to be quite a, a, a high theme when you uh, uh, improve your, your uh, software development uh, way of doing in, in larger scale. But also developer experience is, is uh, pretty topical at the moment. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not so common topic uh, for, for companies to check out. But the developer portals are basically the tool, practical tool, how you implement those uh, two uh, topics in, in your uh, daily uh, business and daily working. So, so it's a technical solution that you, you can really follow the platform en engineering type of, of uh, model, working model. If we go more into the backstage, uh, uh, backstage uh, is, is um, uh, a technology that are uh, developed by Spotify. And, and uh, as we know, all uh, the, the Spotify is pretty famous of, of their methodology and, and things, how they do, do stuff. But uh, backstage uh, and developer portal started at uh, Spotify, I think it was around uh, 2019 or, or, or uh, in, in that frame and they noticed when they scaled up their, their development, they ended up in a in, uh, little bit uh, worse uh, or a little bit uh, not that uh, good efficiency. And, and uh, uh, they measured uh, how easy it was to newcomers to start developing in their environment. And they, they noticed that it took uh, quite a while for people to really understand the environment uh, where they develop and, and what do they develop. So they basically in practice, uh, they say that they measured the 10th uh, pull re request that the newcomer will do and how long time it will take. And uh, the metric itself uh, uh, describes uh, the complexity in, in their environment. So how easy it's to come, come and, and be productive there. But that was one, one just uh, 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 one thing that they, they noticed that something needs to be done. And when they noticed that something needs to be done, they decided to do some kind of survey that, ho okay, what is actually preventing us from being more productive and more fluent in our work? And those three things uh, came up into that uh, survey, what they found out. Uh, and the, uh, the first and the biggest obstacle for people 
people to be productive in their environment was that there is too much interruptions and too much contextual switching. That it means that uh, uh, someone asks some, someone help and, and, uh, or uh, you first do something here and then you need to stop doing that and start to do something else. And, and we all know that the work of developer has, has become uh, so vast and, and uh, uh, large scale that, that you really need to jump into the uh, infrastructure part and you ne really need to jump to different part of, of uh, development work and it eats up uh, uh, your productivity. Of course, the collaboration and communication is always a uh, challenge in a larger scale development. Different teams uh, does not know each other. Different teams, different people does not know what uh, others are doing or, or what are their strengths or, or doesn't find information that easily. But the third one, what uh, they really noticed was that they have quite significant amount of overlapping uh, work that he, they are doing. Overlapping for them means that they had a lot of components that are uh, pretty close to each other. Not, not uh, totally overlapping, but pretty close uh, overlapping. So. Uh, uh, if working smartly, they would uh, be not obligated to do always a new component. Uh, they might be able to tweak some existing component and use existing code and, and uh, do to that be more productive uh, in, and uh, find more efficiency that way. So basically these were the findings and they thought uh, that, okay, what we should do. And a little bit same than uh, in previous uh, presentation story from Nokia. Uh, they also studied that, okay, what are the solutions available for us? And they didn't really find the good one uh, that they, uh, they would be satisfied. So they decided also, Spotify decided to uh, uh, make their own solution for this, this problem, uh, problem solving. And they basically, what they did was backstage. They called it backstage, and, and uh, the end result uh, that uh, was, was came up was uh, uh, they prepared uh, open platform for building developer portals. So uh, basically, uh, the, the, I think the most important or interesting uh, angles for uh, backstage uh, from general point of view are that they, it's open source nowadays. So they uh, build it uh, by themselves and, and then they notice that, okay, this uh, is uh, such a tool and the problems are very common. So maybe other companies might, uh, might uh, benefit that uh, also and they uh, release it to uh, CNCF uh, and, and now it's an uh, open project for, for Cloud Native Computing uh, Foundation at the moment and, and can be found in, in uh, their, their uh, project list as well. Uh, the one biggest thing uh, was why they decided to build their all, uh, own portal platform was that they really needed to open uh, to, uh, the platform to be open. So uh, at the moment, uh, there are a lot of uh, platform uh, developer portals that are, are uh, in the market, but uh, uh, very uh, many of them are focusing on certain technologies. And Spotify needed that uh, they, they don't have, uh, the portal cannot have any uh, restrictions for the technology. For example, as we uh, heard, uh, heard uh, the first presentation that it's important to be able to work within all these uh, cloud uh, environment, big cloud providers. It's same in, in uh, uh, backstage that uh, it really can operate in, in all environments and in all technology environments as well. And that's, uh, that has been one very key, key uh, uh, thing in, in, in backstage. If I uh, try to put into the nutshell what is uh, developer portal and, and of course what is back backstage at the, at the same. So it's basically, it's an abstraction layer 
between your infrastructure and, and your development work and uh, between, between the uh, developer and, and the teams. So it tries to uh, uh, provide that environment, environment uh, more uh, simple way for the people using it. So it tries to unify for you all the tools you use in, in your development work. It tries to uh, provide you all the components and uh, uh, services that you are developing and all the uh, data pipelines and, and uh, that sort of things uh, uh, to be easily found and easy to easily understandable format uh, for, for you. And how that is built uh, is, is pretty simple, basically. Uh, I don't have the architecture picture, uh, 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 even though you said it's, it's uh, mandatory. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, 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 of course, uh, uh, if, if we try to uh, raise up a little bit uh, uh, perspective, uh, backstage is uh, about three things. It's about the building service catalog, uh, and the service catalog is in, in, in it's a simple list of all your components uh, that you are developing, or your libraries, or or your web services, or or uh, all the components you are developing there. And uh, in order to build a good catalog, you really need to be able to categorize and, and uh, uh, give attributes to those uh, items in the catalog. And for that, you need the ser service definitions uh, to be able to do. So basically, it means that uh, we give attributes and, and uh, uh, definitions for all the components listed in, in the catalog. And the third one, how you build a good uh, uh, developer portal needs a uh, lot of integrations and plugins. And, and uh, uh, the architecture allows you to be very open for your plugins. So it enables you to still use all the tools that your organization uses in software development. And it also uh, allows each team to use uh, different uh, uh, tools uh, in your development work. And uh, uh, all those tools need to be uh, able to integrate seamlessly in, in this portal so it's, it's fluent and, and easy to use. But those three uh, things uh, basically create a backstage in, in all its simplicity. Uh, backstage has uh, basically three purpose. Uh, what do you do, do with it? And uh, it means that you basically uh, uh, create a new, new software. It means that uh, you can start to create a new components going into this platform and, and uh, using templates for, for uh, your, your uh, component and easily start uh, doing, doing the development uh, on, uh, from there on. So you create a new software and, and it uh, tries to make it easy for you. Another one is that you work in a project or you work with the product and you really need to manage uh, your own personal work and, and you need to understand what your teams does and it tries to build you a contextual approach to your work. So it, you can easily find your components that you are responsible for, you understand what kind of task you are pending and, and uh, that sort of thing. And the third one uh, is that you can uh, easily find things what other teams has been developed. So it tries to prevent uh, overlapping work, so it uh, tries to uh, give you uh, good opportunities to find uh, work and components that uh, are done and developed by someone else in the organization. So th th those three uh, purposes for, for this developer portal backstage is, is uh, mainly, mainly uh, in, in use. Uh, maybe I'll jump a little bit about these key features, but basically we already talk about service catalog and we talk about service templates, software templates and plugins. Tech doc, doc, docs, I would like to emphasize uh, very uh, uh, short, shortly, it means that the backstage is 
very commonly used in technical documentation and technical document management. And uh, the strength in, in backstage and documentation is that it ties the documentation very close to development work. It uses the markdown uh, uh, documentation language and it's easy to, to do the documentation itself. But for example, if we use software template to create a new component, uh, the workflow there might create you uh, already the templates uh, for documentation and placeholders for documentation required as, at the same time. So tech docs and uh, technical documentation is very common feature that organizations use. Maybe I try to show you in practice what it looks like. We have a few minutes left and, and uh, uh, I, I might uh, show you a you, uh, few, few use cases. Uh, and uh, let's try if I, I can share the share my screen. Sorry. It's not easy to uh, <laughs> use in the, this context, but okay, it's zoomed uh, uh, quite quite small, but I hope you can you can see something there. Uh, but this is ba basically the landing page of, of uh, vanilla uh, backstage. The content itself is is our our own backstage implementation and some other components that we have in, in Kevo uh, company. But uh, basically, I will show you the, the backstage implementation, how it looks like as a component uh, in, in, in uh, backstage. So when I log in, it recognizes me uh, as, a, as a user belonging to one team, and it really shows me first that, okay, this is my teams and my responsibilities. And now you can see, or I can see that uh, our team is, is responsible for the 12 modules, and, and uh, uh, there are eight external modules and two services, two domains and one system, etc. So, so basically, it really it tries to uh, encapsulate your work and, and uh, responsibilities in single view. And if we uh, try to open, for example, services, we can deep dive then that what are these components uh, all about. Can you zoom up a little? Uh, I tried. Let's try it. Yeah. Now it's oh, great. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> Now you can really see. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, you can you can uh, zoom uh, or deep dive uh, uh, from from these um, uh, uh, links uh, uh, in in uh, going going deeper to uh, really try to understand what it's all about. Now I went to the uh, system uh, and and we have two systems in the in the uh, backstage at the moment, and if I then uh, take a dev, uh, dev tools uh, syst uh, dev tools uh, system there, and uh, I can really see the content of, of, of that. Uh, it basically shows me some basic uh, categorization information for me. It gives me opportunity to uh, look the source code and it uh, gives me opportunity to, to check the documentation. It builds me some kind of relationship map uh, for, for this uh, 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 DevTools uh, system over there. And it uh, shows me that uh, do I have a components underneath it. And if I go to the component, for example, Kevo Backstage component, it shows me that component's details. And uh, when I mentioned that uh, uh, Backstage tries to build you the whole infrastructure uh, in a clarified way for you as a developer, it shows uh, uh, like uh, these uh, 
uh, upside navigators uh, in, in this upper side of, of screen, where it's overview, CI, CD, JIRA, dependencies, pull request docs. So that is basically uh, the contextual tool selection for you, and that is basically the, the status of your component, what you are developing there. For example, in this uh, component website, Kevo Backstage, we can check the C CICD continuous uh, integration uh, status there. It uh, actually is now uh, integrated to the uh, uh, tools that are used in, in uh, uh, CI/CD purposes, and I can I can uh, also drive and run uh, run those those uh, uh, queues here. Uh, Jira uh, integration it shows you, uh, fetch you uh, information that you define uh, from y uh, Jira. Uh, it fetch you here. Uh, now it's a little bit. Uh, uh, not that much information there, but uh, you can see the, the principle. It shows you dependencies if you have defined the dependencies for this component, and it shows you pull requests uh, that are in, in certain status, and, and you really can uh, get a good uh, understanding easily uh, what, what's all about, about this, this component. And uh, that's, that's how it builds you the, the infrastructure and, and all the data about this, this uh, certain, certain component. If I just uh, want to look at the catalog itself, uh, as I mentioned, it's a very simple list of, of components and, and then you can deep dive, you can filter of course and, and try, to, try to find things. And uh, you can also then uh, explore if you want to really understand what's uh, as in organization, what has been developed. You can also uh, deep dive in, in uh, other perspectives. For example, now in our implementation, there are domains, there are systems, and there are teams. Uh, for example, uh, Kevo team, and, and now I can see what Kevo team has done and who is belonging there, and etc. So this is uh, just a glimpse for you what uh, uh, developer portal means, what backstage uh, means, and, and uh, uh, how it's, it, can be, it can be used. One more uh, very shortly uh, in, in this uh, as a summary. Uh, what this uh, uh, developer portal basically means for the developer point of view, it really uh, builds a centralized local, uh, location for, for tools and services and information, and it helps you to uh, be effective in your, your work and uh, tries to build, uh, tries to build uh, a contextual approach to your work so you uh, find your things more, more easily then. And from the company point of view, of course, it tries to build a efficiency, and of course, uh, it tries to build a better quality into the pro uh, product itself. Uh, and and uh, uh, they have even in Spotify uh, measured that the people and developers who use the developer portal there, they tend to be longer in the organization and, and uh, then, then happier. So maybe it's... Uh, uh, improved uh, the uh, uh, developer experience, as, as was told uh, prior. So, uh, as a Kevo, uh, this is open source, so we don't sell uh, backstage, but we help you to, to implement and we help you to, to take uh, every, everything out of it if you, if you need help. Uh, backstage is pretty simple to get the vanilla version out and, and uh, going on, but uh, we have learned that, that uh, uh, if you want to go deeper, as you probably want, uh, it's it's good that you can discuss and and get coached by someone who has uh, has already been there uh, a little bit longer. But that's about the uh, backstage. Any any questions for for me? 
please. Uh, at the moment, uh, we our people has been implementing three uh, in three organizations backstage, and, and but I'm not allowed to give them uh, the organization names. But what we have uh, learned from the public, what organizations have stated uh, who uses, I have uh, uh, read that OP Bank is is. Uh, uh, have a backstage implementation in their environment. And then uh, there is a list of organizations that are implemented backstage in, in uh, the, the open source data. And I found Fortum listed there. So probably Fortum is also using backstage. Uh, I have been now meeting quite a lot of organizations and I have found out that there are uh, organizations that are doing the implementation or prototyping or proof of concept at the moment uh, in, in quite many places, but uh, not the live environment that many yet. And all the, all the, all the starting videos, starting videos is like the presentation <coughs> app or starting, then it's kind of uh, exploded and now they are doing like the service, service catalog. I have understood also that it's a quite huge and big thing and, and they started from one point and one purpose and, and they really have extended it. it uh. Yes, please. Yeah. And the problem is create something and, and put that somewhere yeah. and source it inside. So how, how, how much is it like auto discovered so that it's easy to like that? Yes, uh, I may reply the question, how much uh, things are auto-discovered and how much needs to be manually implemented, uh, the data around it. Uh, you really touch the pinpoint of the implementation, so it's very uh, important that you can uh, get the data as automated as possible. Otherwise, it uh, doesn't keep up and, and it, it uh, takes uh, uh, somehow... Uh, data gets old. Not everything is auto-discovered. Uh, some of the data uh, it can be included in the template uh, and template process, so you give uh, some information uh, during uh, the creation phase. Some of them are, are fetched uh, uh, in, in uh, 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 repository and, and the code itself and uh, I uh, one of the Finnish organization told me that they are using quite a lot of uh, AI actually to deep dive in the source code and fetch the data out out of it but it's it's a combination of, of uh, uh, some fetched data and and uh, then then uh, some some manual work but when you have established the integration and, uh, and you have established uh, the data uh, itself in there, then it keeps up the, the uh, due to integration, so it, it uh, keeps up updated afterwards. So it's not needed to all the time be, be updated manually. But that's a very uh, important aspect in the implementation. Uh, unfortunately, I, I cannot say 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 to that or, or don't know answer. But uh, what I do that uh, companies are doing, the, uh, especially the uh, GitHub repository, and, and try to uh, discover information using AI tools uh, in in that. Please. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, Backstage has a pretty uh, vast uh, developer uh, 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 
people who develop and, and contribute already. And uh, considering, for example, uh, those um, uh, integrations, there are more than 100 tools already integrated there. But uh, uh, what I have learned that some of those uh, already made integrations are a little bit limited functionality, so you might need to uh, be, be forced to somehow tweak them or, or enhance the uh, uh, functionality in, in those integrations. But there are a lot of uh, material already available for, for backstage. Uh, basically, uh, almost in every case you have to do something. Uh, and, uh, but the reason is very often, as you already mentioned, uh, uh, considering OP, that it tends to start from one uh, corner and then the implementation gets uh, much more vaster. So it's, uh, when you go further, uh, then you probably need to, need to uh, put some, some customization work. For example, in one of our implementation, uh, the, the uh, core problem was actually to be uh, to understand in which environment, uh, which version of each component is uh, published and, and uh, going on. So that was a pretty, uh, I would say, uh, pretty common problem, but uh, there was no no ready-made integration for that. So they needed to do some some coding for for that kind of uh, needs. Then I know uh, one another uh, company who started actually from just uh, they wanted to improve the technical documentation uh, level and quality of, of technical documentation. So they uh, they could uh, start up with very vanilla kind of of uh, functionality, but but afterwards, they extended uh, their implementations as well. So uh, you usually, if we uh, study the stories of uh, bigger enterprises, they usually start to build up some kind of uh, small team around uh, Spotify, uh, around backstage. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, basically in, in developer, uh, in, in this platform engineering model, it's in that, uh, that uh, platform team. And, and that um, uh, team is r responsible for this implementation and, and helps to implement it further. Definitely, and you can also index outside uh, sp uh, backstage uh, repositories. So, for example, Confluence or uh, other other uh, repositories as well. So, so, and that's very uh, key functionality uh, and, and very important functionality in this scheme. Please. Yeah, just kind of uh, thinking about kind of uh, the a bit of. Uh, short history of IT that in the early millennium uh, came the agile development in a big scale, meaning that uh, kind of we got the adaptability to the projects to, to change their direction. And then, well, last decade, it was more like DevOps, kind of how we could deliver fast to the customers. And uh, now I see the next big thing out of this uh, platform engineering. So that uh, how do you increase the productivity uh, in the developer side? So how, and, and okay, if you think about all these three things, they have the thing in common is that the, how do you get faster from idea to product? So we have done the, uh, Agile has been kind of a, maturing a lot, DevOps has been maturing a lot, and next big thing is the platform engineering. And uh, now what I've seen, what I've seen personally so far has been, there has been some kind of a proprietary solutions. Backstage is, is maybe the first ones kind of, a, which is kind of a common for, commonly available. Then again, the question is that if I think about the early days of, of DevOps, and, and uh, I remember things like VMware, Vagrant, Puppet, uh, well, they are still maybe used in, in some areas, yeah, but they are kind of a minor players in the area nowadays. So 
the question would be that would backstage be the big thing for platform engineering or not, but anyway, platform engineering is coming up now, and that would be the next, next big thing. That's very, very good. Uh, summary of, of uh, what it's all about, and it's some someone says that it's it's uh, it's like uh, DevOps, self-service DevOps, or, or kind of uh, how you can also describe it. But uh, uh, the volume that backstage already have around it, and the fuss and buzz, I believe it it uh, it's uh, going to be pretty solid uh, player in in the uh, in the field. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to uh, be with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was the last presentation for today. And as long as uh, uh, Pasi gives us the permission so we can stay here. Maybe he has a few words to say for us. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, the sauna is still warm. There's plenty of drinks. Uh, so uh, I don't know if there's any sandwiches left, but at least there's some snacks and, uh, and drinks. And, and as I said, the sauna is warm. Everybody's welcome. So thank you for coming here and uh, hope to see you again. So I asked the, the speakers to uh, get their materials to our Slack. And, uh, well, like I mentioned to some people already that uh, uh, we have started the habit that we announce new events first in Slack and then kind of announce it via meetup.com. So if you want to be the first ones to know about the new next event, so join our Slack. The link is in the end of the agenda. Thank you. <laughs>